Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons. If you've missed any of our past presentations, would like to view them, please email me. I'll be posting my email address in the chat box. Feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have as well. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're very delighted to highlight one of our extraordinary expert physician and faculty members of UPMC in the University of Pitts Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery, Dr. Michael Lang. But first, I would like to welcome our Chair of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Friedlander, to give an update on the happenings from the last week. Dr. Friedlander, thank you, and please take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Justin, and again, uh, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to uh, uh, today's event. Uh, as I usually do, I'd like to provide a little update on the uh, COVID situation here in our hospital, say a few comments, and then I'll introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Lang. Uh, as I've uh, always uh, made the point uh, to uh, reassure all of our uh, listeners that uh, our hospitals uh, here in the Pittsburgh are extremely safe. Uh, we're very, very fortunate that the number of uh, COVID positive uh, patients uh, remains uh, very low and actually right now is uh, the time that they're amongst the lowest that they've ever uh, been here since uh, really the pandemic uh, started and the numbers uh, began to go up. Our hospitals take uh, extreme measures in uh, um, enhancing the, um, the safety by uh, monitoring and uh, questioning every individual coming into the hospital. Everybody gets a questionnaire uh, pertaining exposure. Everybody's temperature is uh, measured. We're limiting the number of uh, uh, visitors uh, to the hospital. And again, our, our hospital remains uh, very, very safe with a uh, very few COVID positive uh, patients and, and they're isolated in, uh, in special uh, COVID uh, wards. Uh, also, our surgical patients, uh, all of them have the opportunity to be tested uh, prior to uh, coming in. And uh, I feel very, very safe uh, myself in the hospital as well as uh, bringing my own patients uh, in for um, uh, elective or scheduled type of uh, uh, procedures. Again, in neurosurgery, nothing is really elective. I would uh, call them uh, scheduled. As we've gone through this uh, series, we've uh, uh, experienced uh, different uh, times and momentum within the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. I am uh, starting uh, to see and hope that in the uh, uh, near future, meaning the coming months, uh, there'll be better and better treatments and hopefully a vaccine um, sometime, in, as I said, in the next few months, uh, maybe by the end of the calendar year uh, or so, it'll take uh, quite a bit of time uh, before they get uh, distributed. Uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, to that uh, uh, date. Um, now, moving to today's uh, presentation, uh, you know, I am uh, biased in the, the following statement that uh, cerebrovascular neurosurgery is really the pinnacle of not only neurosurgery, but probably one of the most complex, if not the most complex uh, type of treatment in all of medicine and uh, in, in neurosurgery. Uh, it takes an extreme level of precision, dexterity, a thought process uh, to manage these really very, very complex uh, lesions. There's a lot at stake uh, when when, uh, when we manage uh, these, uh, these uh, lesions and th th there's a broad variety of them. And we've been fortunate over the past uh, 20 or so years that the armamentarium for neurosurgeons has uh, expanded significantly. In particular, uh, uh, two different uh, aspects of which uh, Dr. Lang will talk about. One is the endovascular management of uh, blood vessel problems, which uh, where again, uh, we go from inside the blood vessel without the need to perform a craniotomy and open the, uh, the head, as well as uh, advanced uh, revascularization type of uh, procedures, which are technically uh, extremely uh, challenging and very few people around the world are able to do very well. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, myself, as well as our department and hospital to be able to recruit uh, an individual as talented and, and caring as uh, Dr. Lang. Dr. Lang's been here uh, for a bit over a year and he's already made a huge splash uh, within the time that he's uh, here. He did his uh, uh, neurosurgery training at uh, Jefferson uh, in uh, Philadelphia, which is one of the uh, top uh, places, particularly for endovascular surgery, and then spent 
a year at the Barrett Neurological Institute where he did a uh, open neurovascular uh, fellowship uh, and likewise it's a really a top uh, uh, place and he is just a top uh, uh, physician and surgeon that's been able to uh, really uh, change the way that we manage a number of uh, diseases. So I'm uh, very proud that he's a part of our family and uh, really uh, doing very, very great work. So Dr. Lang, uh, welcome and uh, please take it away. Robert, well, thank you so much for uh, for those kind words. I'm not sure I've I've done enough to to earn them, but um, I very much appreciate it. It's uh, it's wonderful to be here. I know we had a couple of scheduling, uh, you know, snafus. I think you know you and I both had to had to reschedule once, and uh, it's just nice to be able to get here and and share the thing that I love. Um, and I think, as you alluded to, I've had the great pleasure of training with uh, some of the best uh, cerebrovascular surgeons in the world. Um, people who have taken uh, great care in in my mentorship and um, and have really helped advance my capacity to go out into the world and, and help people and um, and so it's a real honor to be able to to do the things that we do and and hopefully be, to be able to offer all of the treatments for a disease process like cerebral aneurysms. So um, that's uh, that's what the topic for today is going to be. So without further ado. Uh, I don't have any disclosures uh, relevant to this talk. And so just by way of outline, um, so, uh, you know, I know this is a bit of a mixed audience. So we're going to start off with kind of a, a broad background of cerebral aneurysms, why we care about it, what they are, um, and, and broadly how we think about it, why they're relevant. We're going to talk about kind of the intersection of where my practice lives uh, between the, the microsurgical field and the, um, the endovascular field which uh, for a lot of years have, have felt in competition. People feel that they have to stake out an area. And my belief is that they are, are the right and left hand that, that take care of this problem. And I think uh, I feel very fortunate that, that I get to do both and, and pick the, the thing that I think is, is best and safest for any individual patient. And then finally, we're gonna end with, uh, with a handful of cases that kind of illustrate all those points. So, um, Brain aneurysm is a term that uh, a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, basically, it's like a balloon on the side of a, a blood vessel, what one of my former uh, tumor faculty when I was in training referred to uh, only halfway derisively as, uh, as blood bubbles. Um, but they, they are one of the truly scary things that we deal with in neurosurgery. Most don't cause any noticeable symptoms until they're a real problem, until they rupture, until they cause you know, massive compression on, on critical structures. And one of the things that has always excited me about this field is that there's a huge range of, of morphologies, of shapes and sizes and locations and clinical scenarios. There's, you know, every case that we do is a little bit different than the last one. Uh, the, the angles that we work at, the situation for the patient, and that's where having all of the tools in the toolbox uh, really becomes critical because there are so many variations of what we do and it's what keeps it exciting, but also what makes it so challenging. So, uh, you know, some brief numbers about this uh, for people who are not all that familiar with, with cerebral aneurysm. So um, it's a disease process that uh, tends to, when it occurs uh, symptomatically, to occur at a younger age than, than other types of stroke. We consider an, a ruptured aneurysm as a bleeding type of stroke, as opposed to the more common ischemic or, or blocked blood vessel type of stroke. And so it tends to occur in, uh, in patients uh, around the peak of age 50 to 60 or so. Um, and as a result, the, the consequence of people going through that kind of devastating event uh, tend to be uh, near on par with, um, uh, with the ischemic burden, even though it's a much smaller number of people uh, because the people who are affected are so profoundly affected by it. Worldwide, we think about 3% of people harbor brain aneurysms. We used to think it was very rare, but as we do more and more brain imaging uh, for other reasons, we, we come to find aneurysms and the vast majority are small and in safe locations that we can watch safely. But there are a great number that uh, that do need treatment and, and figuring out which aneurysm is which uh, is very critical for us. In the US, about 30,000 people will rupture an aneurysm in any given year. Um, and the frequency is enough that for a patient coming into the emergency department for evaluation of a severe headache, uh, it's about one in 100 people or as many as uh, four in 100 who will harbor a, a truly ruptured aneurysm. Um, so it means it's a really critical thing to have in the back of your mind as a practitioner, um, even though headaches are, are a very common presentation. And it, when an aneurysm ruptures, it bleeds into the space where the spinal fluid lives that we call the subarachnoid space, and it is a devastating, life-altering, and very frequently life-ending event. 
Uh, 15 to 30 percent of people will die before they ever even make it to the hospital. Uh, of those that do survive, still about 50 percent uh, will die no matter what we do. And of those who survive, about 70 percent will have at least some degree of ongoing neurologic injury. So it's very critical that we were able to provide the appropriate support um, for those patients and also to be able to understand the patients that we can prevent that kind of event in. Um, and and the, the patients who have a subarachnoid hemorrhage are among the sickest in the hospital. They demand multidisciplinary care, a critical care team, our stroke neurologists, uh, our general surgeons who are involved in any number of procedures that they end up requiring. It's, um, it's truly a team effort and, and one that requires a system that is dedicated uh, to this kind of patient. There are a handful of risk factors that we know. Um, the one that we worry most about, and, and though I tell my patients I never like giving the lecture about smoking, I find myself doing it every time I'm in clinic. Uh, tobacco use is the number one modifiable risk factor that we know. So if you can change one thing to reduce the risk of you forming an aneurysm, having one grow, or potentially having one rupture, it's cigarette smoking. We tend to think that there, you know, there's some evidence that uh, e-cigarettes may be slightly less harm, uh, but we still know that nicotine is the primary driver um, and, and tobacco and nicotine use in general is something that is very much contraindicated in somebody with risk for brain aneurysms. There is some association with family history, although there are certain groups that would, would dispute that. Uh, but generally, we think that people that have two or more family members are at an increased risk relative to the general population. And then there are a handful of genetic syndromes uh, where aneurysms can be uh, more common. They're typically related to the connective tissues of the body. Patients who present with an aneurysm uh, that, that's concerning uh, typically present with what we call a thunderclap headache or the worst headache of their life, something uh, that's different than anything they've ever felt before, very frequently accompanied by severe neck pain. Um, the, there are rare aneurysms that, that can present with uh, pressure on nerves. One of the ones we worry about most commonly causes the eye to dilate. And that's a sign of an impending catastrophic rupture if it happens before you know, a true headache and we still treat those emergently. And very frequently, patients will lose consciousness at the, at the bleeding event uh, of a ruptured aneurysm and can be mistaken for traumatic patients. And so it's very critical to have this in the back of your mind uh, as a possibility. And as time has gone forward, as, as Dr. Friedlander alluded to, uh, aneurysm surgery has become more and more complex. The neuroimaging that we do, the providers from a variety of different backgrounds uh, with, with different techniques and capacities and interests um, are all involved. Observation is always uh, a possibility uh, with brain aneurysms. Again, the majority that we see are, are small and uh, we think have a benign course. So understanding the appropriate modalities and, and having knowledge of the high risk features that might warrant uh, subsequent treatment is very critical. Neurosurgeons, uh, really the, the group that defined the, the treatment of brain aneurysms, Walter Dandy clipped the first, I believe in 1932 with a, a silver clip. And it wasn't until the mid 60s when the microscope was brought into the operating room that, that the field really accelerated under the likes of Gazi Yazergil and Charlie Drake and Thor Sunt and, and others uh, who really advanced the field uh, to the state it's in today. The endovascular techniques were originally developed by our interventional radiology colleagues, taken up by neurosurgeons and more recently by neurologists. Um, and have really revolutionized the field. The technology is evolving at, at a massive pace to the point where I spent a year away doing a, a complex microsurgical fellowship and the number of new devices that, was, that had become available even in a year was astounding and, and felt like I really had to catch up. And there are a number of treatments that we do endovascularly that really are uh, very well established and, and some that I would argue are the gold standard of care for certain brain aneurysms. And the, the innovation that's coming out is changing by the day. So it's a very, very exciting field to be a part of. When we think about the, these two subspecialties, um, microsurgery is, is again the classic tried and true way of dealing with this. We uh, have to make an incision in the skin, we have to open the skull. We know very well what the outcomes are. In general, the, the rates of an aneurysm coming back after it's been well clipped are very, very low. It's the only technology that we have that physically closes down the neck of uh, that balloon on the side of a blood vessel. Uh, the downside, though, obviously, it does require an incision, an incision on the head that can have some degree of, of cosmetic effect. It does require manipulation of the, uh, the tissue surrounding the brain. Typically, we operate in the space outside of the brain tissue itself where the aneurysms live. And so uh, a, a true delicate hand and that, that dexterity that Dr. Friedlander alluded to is a, a critical component of what we do. This is, the stays in the hospital tend to be longer, although we'll come back to this a little bit later. I would say that in my practice now, using more mini approaches, 
the uh, the stay in the hospital is is typically the same for both my microsurgical and endovascular patients for for most routine aneurysms. On the endovascular side, uh, we're able to do it through a poke in the groin, or now very frequently in my practice, I, I try to use the wrist because our cardiac colleagues have, have really shown the value of that in terms of overall patient outcome. The technologies are very rapidly evolving, uh, which is wonderful. There's always a new exciting device for us to try. The challenge uh, in that space is that very frequently we're on to the next new and exciting thing before we really have a chance to understand the long-term implication of, of what we put in yesterday. Um, and so having a mind for what are truly revolutionary technologies versus new features um, versus something that is likely a flash in the pan is really a critical part of, of the modern end of asset practice. The downside, very frequently, um, there can be a higher risk of recurrence and, and lower occlusion rates. But again, there are some novel technologies that I think are really changing that paradigm. Um, but really across the board, the, the recovery is, is much more simple uh, or is much simpler than, than most microsurgical patients. But the way I counsel my patients is that no matter what we choose, it's still a brain surgery. Uh, I, I really issued the, um, the minimal, minimally invasive surgery moniker for either microsurgery or for endovascular surgery. Um, I think uh, endovascular techniques are minimal access. What it takes to get there, the morbidity that we encounter to get to where we need to be is relatively low. But at the end of the day, the risks that any patient cares about are, are the same. Is the aneurysm gone? Is there a risk that it will bleed again at some point in the future? And has there been any damage to the neural structures or, or the normal blood vessels? Have we incurred any strokes as a result of our treatment? So at the end of the day, really parsing out uh, given techniques for a given patient means you have to have a clear understanding of which techniques are best in your own hands and having uh, a knowledge of, of what's out there. It really forces us to engage with the entirety of the field. And, uh, and I will say from a purely microsurgical approach, that can be a challenge when, when the endovascular field is evolving so rapidly. Um, but I, I think it's, it's critical that we think of, of them as just different ways of dealing with the same problem, different ways of getting to the same space. So the, uh, I'll talk briefly about two of the studies that have defined you know, the, this debate, um, the ISAT trial and the, the Barrow ruptured aneurysm trial, which are the two biggest trials that we have for the treatment of ruptured brain aneurysms, comparing endovascular coiling techniques versus microsurgical clipping techniques. Now, uh, this is not the right form to get into the strengths and limitations of each of these, but suffice it to say that the ISAT trial was run out of Europe and, and was the first trial to really demonstrate that there was, an, at the very least, an early benefit within the first six months to a year for patients that could be safely treated by endovascular means. The Barrow ruptured aneurysm trial was revolutionary in that it was designed to be a so-called real world trial where patients were randomized um, to one treatment paradigm or another um, at a center with some of the, the true giants of the field on both ends of the spectrum. Um, and in both trials in the early phase, it, it was demonstrated that patients tended to do better uh, if they were treated with endovascular means. And certainly the brain is very sensitive. You'll see in some of the videos we show just how, you know, how ugly the brain looks in, a, in the setting of a ruptured aneurysm. But after that time, the differences seem to disappear. And that's the, that's the real challenge is that very frequently we're not speaking the same language, right? The, the, the people who clip aneurysms will always point to the fact that uh, it tends to be a very, um, you know, clear-cut surgery with a low risk of recurrence uh, and a low chance you would ever have to come back for another procedure, whereas the, the endovascular practitioners are, are quick to point out that the, the consequence of recurrence after an endovascular-treated aneurysm is much lower and that, you know, at least in the early phase, patients tend to do better. Um, but again, it's a matter of choosing the right technique for the right patient. And both fields are, are very much evolving. Um, so in the top left, there's a picture of one of my patients undergoing uh, a mini terrional craniotomy. Typically, I, I clip most aneurysms now through an incision about an inch, inch and a half long. The one you see there is actually a little bit longer than, than I do typically. Um, uh, one of my true passions uh, is cerebral bypass. Um, and I had the good fortune of training with, uh, with one of the true giants in that field, uh, Dr. Michael Lawton down at BNI. Uh, who, is, who has revolutionized the technique and really thought creatively about how to use revascularization strategies to treat aneurysms that are otherwise untreat, untreatable. Um, talking about expanding the range of what's possible. On the endovascular side, there are techniques that have revolutionized what we do. Flow diversion has been around in the U.S. for almost 10 years now. It was approved by the FDA in 2011 uh, and really brought a novel approach wherein, as opposed to treating the aneurysm itself, 
we actually treated the parent vessel. Uh, this, uh, this is a fine mesh stent that basically allows uh, the scaffolding of the inner layer of the blood vessel to seal off the, uh, the aneurysm. And we know that aneurysms that are treated with flow diversion, once they're gone, they don't come back. It is as or more definitive than a microsurgical clipping procedure. Um, and certainly revolutionary from that perspective on the endovascular side, the woven endobridge uh, or web device is an intrasacular device which, which accomplishes the same idea and actually sits inside the aneurysm and, and potentially avoids some of the downfalls of having metal sitting inside a normal artery. And again, these techniques are, are evolving what we do. So I wanted to show you guys a few cases of, of what we do. I wanted to start out with some things that are, are really straight down the middle that most practitioners I think would say that should definitely be treated microsurgically, that should definitely be treated endovascularly. And then I wanted to show you a handful of cases where we dealt with very similar pathology in, in two very different ways based on the clinical presentation, based on the anatomy, um, and what, you know, what the, the overall picture was. And, and um, one, of, uh, one of the guys I trained with used to like to say that um, he felt that what was easy for him to do endovascularly was very frequently hard to do microsurgically and vice versa. My belief is that that, that is certainly very true, but I would like to have my skill sets overlap as much as possible so that we can really hinge our decisions on, on the finest amount of detail possible. And then finally, I want to show you a handful of cases that, that really push the limits of, of what I thought I was capable of and I think are, are helping to advance the field and tackle things that um, there was a time in my life that I wouldn't have thought possible and, and now uh, I know that we can do and can do safely and, uh, and hopefully we can change people's lives. So here are some of the straightforward ones. This was a 64 year old male uh, who presented recently with a large volume subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, he had this very ugly posterior communicating artery aneurysm. There is a small posterior communicating artery that arises down near the base of the aneurysm, but he had a very large uh, PCA coming off of his uh, vertebral basilar circulation. Uh, so we didn't, we felt very confident that we could uh, coil this off um, entirely, uh, particularly given his clinical situation without any significant consequence. And you can see the end result of this here. Uh, we did this procedure through the artery in the wrist. Uh, so afterwards, the patient was able to sit up right away, uh, which helps reduce his intracranial pressures and, and helps us facilitate opening up his lungs and a lot of the other medical complications that come from just having to lay flat after a procedure, which is a consequence of doing something through the groin. Um, so we brought up a catheter in the aneurysm and we're able to coil it primarily uh, and we have a beautiful result. Uh, and so I think that's a, a very classic straightforward uh, aneurysm that we deal with. This was a 59 year old male uh, who on workup of headaches uh, or chronic type headaches was found to have this irregular MCA aneurysm that you can see in the top left here. Um, he also had the, this little gift of a, a tiny ACOM that we dealt with at the same time. So. Uh, we were able to do this through a mini terional approach. You can see here in the bottom right, this is the, the line of the incision. This is six weeks out from surgery. Um, and for my patients, about 70% of them, when we do the, these mini approaches, go home the day after surgery. The amount of muscle disruption is drastically less. They're in much less pain. Um, and they wake up with a, a small stereostrip across this incision. Um, and for the most part, uh, people feel up to going home the next day. And it's really made it very easy for me in terms of talking to patients about what uh, their stay in the hospital is likely to be like. And we see here uh, the value of uh, microsurgical clipping in a complex MCA aneurysm. So this was a multi-clip reconstruction, which is very common for me. It's rare that I clip aneurysms with just a single clip, uh, wherein we're able to reconstruct this entire bifurcation and reinforce it so that uh, the risk of the aneurysm ever coming back is, is as close to zero as possible. We quote roughly a 1% risk down the road. The ACOM was gone as well. Um, and, and that's one of the points I'll come back to as well that I think we talk very frequently about uh, clipping procedures as being curative and definitive, uh, but that's only true if we do a definitive job. If we take our time, make sure that all of the normal vessels are open, that we're not crimping them off with the clips, and that we are reconstructing the aneurysm without leaving any blebs or dog ears behind um, and really doing as thorough a job as possible. This last one uh, was a 72 year old patient uh, who presented in a delayed fashion. Uh, he had had a, a pretty severe headache about seven or 10 days previous, still had uh, some subarachnoid hemorrhage when he came in um, and was found to have this large uh, basilar tip aneurysm. This is another procedure we did through the artery and the wrist. Uh, again, we know that overall that if we can do that safely, that it tends to be safer for patients. Um, and this is a procedure that we completed using a single stent, uh, different from the pipeline stents that we referred to. This one designed to help hold coils in place inside the dome. 
that ran from the posterior cerebral artery here down into the basilar artery. Uh, and you can see that uh, in this video, we actually have a loop of coil out to help stabilize the microcatheter as we're deploying the stent, uh, and then went on to coil the aneurysm. Uh, and this patient did very well uh, and was able to be discharged uh, from the hospital, uh, able to walk and, and talk on his own and, and care for himself, um, which again, we would expect from his low grade at presentation. Um, but I will tell you that, that in my hands now, this is an aneurysm that I would think strongly about using the web device. Over here at the right is my first uh, web case. This was a, an aneurysm that had previously been coiled but had a substantial recurrence. We deployed uh, this, this device in about 20 minutes and there's, there's nothing significant in the parent artery, so there's less metal, uh, less concern uh, for stroke or, or other thromboembolic complications. Uh, and a technology that I think for the right aneurysm is, is going to revolutionize what we're capable of. So this is a 69-year-old patient uh, who had a previously ruptured uh, posterior communicating artery aneurysm that was coiled multiple times, re continued to recur. Again, uh, tobacco use being the, the usual culprit in that scenario. Uh, you can see here, the, these dark lines here are the ends of, of an enterprise stent that was used to help hold coils in place. But this aneurysm continued to, uh, to recur. Um, and so when she came to me, we, we elected given the configuration here and her overall health, her tobacco use, her COPD, that treating this endovascularly uh, would be the most definitive. And given the coil mass here, the fact that it, the coil has come all the way down to the neck of the aneurysm really precludes us from doing anything microsurgically. Uh, the risk that, that we would um, occlude her posterior communicating artery or even worse, her uh, internal carotid artery, uh, trying to clip around that that thick, heavy bulk of clips um, is very is very hard um, and and fundamentally impossible in, in this patient. Um, the the only other option we would have from a microsurgical standpoint would be to do a revascularization uh, technique or a bypass, uh, like we've discussed previously, or, or potentially shutting down the normal parent artery and hoping that the normal uh, communicating vessels are sufficient. Um, but we have a much simpler approach. So uh, in, in about a 30 minute period of time, we're able to deploy this pipeline flow diverting stent. We used a longer device here to make sure we landed uh, in a stable segment of the artery and really um, uh, opposed it all the way against the vessel walls as we came down through the proximal carotid. And at six months, the aneurysm is completely gone. And we know that in this case, the, the lining of the blood vessel, the intima, will heal over the stent, or has it already in this case, and the chance of this uh, aneurysm coming back is zero. Once it's healed, it is healed. There are rare cases of giant aneurysms where the clot can continue to grow in spite of um, uh, angiographic occlusion, but once it's gone, it's gone with this technique. And I think we should consider it a, uh, a truly definitive technology. This is a 76-year-old patient uh, who also was a previous subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, she presented with this aneurysm originally that was coiled. Uh, there's a large, what we call fetal configuration, uh, posterior communicating artery. And when she, another patient who continued to smoke, and when she came back, uh, one of my predecessors placed a stent to try and protect this artery so that uh, a more robust coiling could be done. And you can see that this is a beautiful job. This aneurysm looks uh, very well treated endovascularly. The coils come all the way out to the parent ICA. The fetal uh, communicating artery is, is wide open. Um, I don't think you can treat this in a better fashion endovascularly uh, using the stent and coil construct. It was very, very well done. But uh, again, patients who continue to smoke in this scenario, particularly if they have a history of ruptured aneurysm, are more prone and this aneurysm continue to grow. Uh, we see kind of an ugly multilobular recurrence. And given this configuration, uh, we elected to treat this uh, microsurgically. The, this aneurysm had enough of a neck on it, despite that coil mass, that we felt that we would be safe, able to safely place a clip. You can see here through a mini terional approach, that we've started to dissect out the ICA, and now we can see the coils around the aneurysm. We're starting to dissect the dome of the aneurysm now that we have proximal control. Here we're sharply dissecting around that fetal posterior communicating artery, opening up the membrane of Lilliquist underneath uh, that will help us allow additional spinal fluid to come off. Here we're protecting the anterior choroidal artery, which is uh, one of the critical vessels in close proximity to a, a PCOM aneurysm. And then we're able to close down the majority of the neck with a single simple straight clip. Again, this right-sided posterior communicating artery aneurysm is, is generally speaking one of the more straightforward ones we deal with. 
um, but not always. Here we're clipping a small dog ear. And then at the end, we listen to the vessels with a Doppler ultrasound, use ICG video angiography under the microscope. And then my practice is, uh, as a matter of routine, do uh, intraoperative angiograms. And that's, you can see that there was the opening that we had. Oops, sorry, let me go back a sec. So that's the space we work through. The opening is about the size of a quarter. And this is the patient at six weeks. Uh, this is her incision uh, that in another six weeks uh, healed down to a, a very thin line. There's no wasting of the muscle here, which can leave patients with a bit of a scalloped out appearance. Uh, and this patient is neurologically intact. Her aneurysm is as cured as I can possibly make it. Um, and it allows us a less uh, aggressive follow-up regimen as well. This is a carotid ophthalmic aneurysm, which is uh, really one of the aneurysms that, that we treat endovascularly now primarily. Uh, the flow diverting stent technology uh, has made this aneurysm very, very simple to deal with. I generally tell my patients that, that I can order a pizza starting the, the case and be done with the procedure by the time it gets delivered. Now, there are exceptions, but we're fortunate that this patient had very straightforward vessels to traverse. We're able to use a nice short device, which tends to open up beautifully. And at six months, that aneurysm was gone. Um, and uh, I would say that for the majority of, of aneurysms in this region, what we call paraclinoid aneurysms, uh, that is, in my mind, the treatment of choice. Uh, but I, there are critical aneurysms that, that do need to be dealt with microsurgically. And I think it's very important for us to not forget those techniques and understand the complex anatomy in this region so that when it's necessary to deal with it, that we have that capability. And I'm very fortunate uh, that I had uh, mentors who, who made sure that I understood how to do this aneurysm the other way. So this was a patient, a 65 year old, who presented uh, in, in very bad shape. She had this large clot in the base of her right frontal lobe, uh, as well as diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage. We can see that on the right, she has this ugly looking carotid ophthalmic aneurysm, this little excrescence here up at the top is where the aneurysm ruptured. This is a very unstable aneurysm, high risk of rupturing again. And it turns out she had a mirror aneurysm over on the other side. So there are a number of ways that people have dealt with this. Uh, so I've seen it managed where this patient uh, would be coiled first and then taken to the operating room to have the skull taken off and have the clot taken out. But in the time it takes to do that aneurysm, uh, patients can die from the pressure in their head. And this particular patient, even though we elected to go to the operating room emergently, started to blow a pupil, started to show signs that her brainstem was being pressed on in a, in a soon to be irreversible manner uh, that I don't think she would have uh, survived waiting to have her aneurysm coiled. The other option is to do the reverse, is to take her to the operating room, take off the skull, give the brain room to swell, and then uh, go down to the angiography suite immediately thereafter and, and coil the aneurysm, potentially do flow diversion, what have you. Um, but I've also seen uh, these aneurysms that as soon as you uh, open up the, the dura, the covering of the brain, that aneurysm can explode, particularly in this configuration with a large clot in the brain tissue. This tends to be very unstable. Um, and I think, you know, if we're going to take this patient to the operating room, we should be equipped to do everything she needs, which you can see from this third option is a lot. So the hemicranium means taking off half of her skull. In order to get adequate access to this aneurysm, we actually took off part of the, the bone around her brow line, what we call the orbital rim. We drilled out part of the bone that juts just next to the carotid artery in this region that we call the clinoid. And you can see here this big airspace in her frontal sinus that we had to think about how we were gonna repair at the end so that she didn't develop uh, an infection or a leak just spinal fluid out of her nose. Um, so we had to be able to prepare uh, to deal with that while we we're in the midst of, of trying to open up her head emergently to take the pressure off of her brain. And given the configuration here, it can be very difficult in this setting to have control of the artery that we can block it off on either side if necessary. Uh, so while uh, one of the mid-level residents and I were in the midst of doing the emergent cranial part of the procedure, one of my phenomenal chiefs was, was in getting the carotid artery exposed in the neck through a little incision, uh, but enough so that if things really went sideways that we had uh, the capacity to deal with it. Um, and this patient actually ended up doing really well. I'm uh, looking forward to showing you guys this video. So the, I'll, I'll briefly kind of scan through this. This was the, the clipping of that, the, the aneurysm that had ruptured the carotid ophthalmic. Uh, here at the end, once we know that it's, it's taken care of, once we've done our, our video angiography, uh, through the microscope. I actually open up the aneurysm and take the pressure off the optic nerve there. 
Um, we've taken out the blood clot in, in this space, which allows the brain to relax further um, and, and removes that inflammatory cascade from the surrounding brain, we think. And then here we're reaching over all the way across to the other side of the head from, in this case, from the right side to the left side. And we're looking at the carotid artery over on the other side. We can see the, uh, the contralateral ophthalmic artery, and here's the neck of the aneurysm. And then with a single clip, we're able to reconstruct this very beautifully. And that's what it looks like. So we removed basically half of the skull uh, in order to give that brain room to swell, uh, which was much less of a problem after removing the blood clot. And you see the clips go you know, from, from the right side all the way over to the left side. And this was the side that had ruptured, and that aneurysm is completely gone. You remember we saw before on the, the CAT scan that very ugly aneurysm with the little weak spot on top of it that we know is a rupture point. And I, I can't make that aneurysm look better than that. That is, in my mind, what we're aiming for with any uh, procedure is, is this kind of perfect reconstruction where all we see is the normal caliber of the vessel uh, and all of the normal vessels open. The, the ophthalmic artery is not really involved. In this case, it was a little bit more forward. Um, but on the other side, it certainly was, as you can see from the operative video. This is a bit of a busy injection, uh, but the aneurysm lived right here. This is the ophthalmic artery coming off. And again, that both of those aneurysms are completely healed. And my expectation is that she will never have issues with those again. And I, I think we had, had this cut out here. Um, these were the aneurysms that I was describing to you, these atypical aneurysms in, related to bloodstream infections. Um, so on the right, uh, endovascular treatment is the mainstay for most of these. They tend to occur very far out in the circulation. Uh, this one was way, way out here, and we were able to thread a catheter all the way up, really at the absolute limit of how far we can reach. And we deposited a little bit of glue just, just in this aneurysm because we were able to get a, a catheter right up to it, as opposed to shooting from way far down and, and stroking out an entire blood vessel territory, uh, but really pocketing our, our glue right in this aneurysm, uh, and the patient did beautifully. He had had a very small stroke in this area from uh, the formation of the aneurysm to begin with and wasn't left with any, any additional stroke afterwards. This one over on the left is very different though. This is off of one of the uh, more proximal branches, off the M2 branch. And this artery actually goes up to, uh, to supply some critical portions of the brain, the sensory cortex in particular. Um, and it's not one that I felt that we could safely embolize without putting the patient at risk uh, for never being able to feel or potentially even be able to move uh, the left side of his body again. So what we did instead was we, we harvested blood vessels from his scalp, uh, or a blood vessel, excuse me, and they actually sewed it onto the surface of the brain. After we found this vessel coming uh, that we knew was going into the aneurysm, we placed a clip across it and injected a type of dye that we can see under fluorescence in the microscope. And we knew that the vessels that are dark on the surface of the brain are the ones that are supplied by that territory. And then we take the clip off, we see a flash of fluorescence coming through, hence the name, a flash fluorescence technique. Uh, and even though this aneurysm can be hard to see, it's socked in with a lot of inflammatory tissue, we knew exactly what blood vessel we needed to supply. And this, this vessel supplies all the way back. Uh, there's some critical little branches that come off of this, uh, this MCA branch here, but the aneurysm itself is entirely gone and the rest of that territory that it was supplied um, was taken care of. So here, even though the majority of these aneurysms, we don't reach for a, a bypass procedure, this is a critical one where we don't need to take uh, a devastating stroke. This patient should be able to get through uh, without severe limitation to that, that type of function. So here's some cases that are, that are kind of at the limits, right? So this is a patient, uh, this was actually the first patient that I did a contralateral clipping procedure on. Um, so this patient had, had been worked up for headaches and has these two very ugly looking um, ACOM and MCA aneurysms. Uh, it, it doesn't show it really well right here, but there's actually another aneurysm uh, more distal in the, in the sylvian fissure, a, a second MCA aneurysm. And then this choroidal artery aneurysm over on the other side. And we see at the end that we're able to reconstruct those vessels entirely. The MCA aneurysm is gone. This is an intraoperative angiogram. It's a little bit less crisp than our formal angiography that we do in the angio suite. And then using a reverse picket fence technique where I actually stacked a number of clips to reconstruct this anterior communicating artery to preserve flow in this particular uh, branch, the uh, anterior cerebral artery, we've got a complete occlusion. So uh, these are the views during the procedure. We actually reach above the optic nerve in this case, as opposed to the contralateral carotid ophthalmic we saw. Uh, and in a lot of patients, reaching this spot is feasible. 
um, not in everybody. More proximally, the posterior communicating artery is almost never visible. It's almost always hidden behind the optic apparatus, and they're able to place a single clip over to that side. And you can see from this video, this is the post-op scan. This patient, we actually did a standard terrional craniotomy to give us a little bit more working room. Um, but you can see the, the array of clips that we have in this patient. And again, my, my firm belief, um, and one of the things that I was very happy to, um, to have been trained to do is that uh, you do whatever is necessary to clip that aneurysm so that it doesn't come back. Exceptions being when you, know, you can't do so safely, you need to make smart choices about are you going to put the patient at risk to get a picture perfect result? Or are you going to make your picture worse by taking an overly aggressive tack? But um, here, you know, this that complex MCA aneurysm required a number of clips to reconstruct that bifurcation. But that's really the power of, of this technique is we can um, utilize these clips in a variety of different ways that allow us to um, to make the blood vessel anatomy look as normal as possible. And then here we can actually see the, the trajectory of that contralateral aneurysm. It's a bit of a long reach, but uh, but certainly very doable. One of these things that uh, I didn't know was possible until I saw it done. You know, one of the things that you read about, uh, but then once you see it, you realize what it takes to do it safely. And that uh, in certain scenarios, it's something that you can accomplish uh, with a great deal of, of care and effort. This was a 58 year old patient who was very medically sick. She was a two pack a day smoker. She had bad COPD somebody that in general I didn't think uh, was a great surgical candidate. And she presented with this very ugly Ica aneurysm arising off her mid basilar trunk uh, that has this large dome here with a number of, uh, well, at least two daughter sacs. Another one is growing a, a secondary sac off of it. We know that from the projection of, of the bleeding pattern that this is what ruptured. Um, so the real critical part here is to contain this rupture site and then do what we can to treat her definitively. Now, uh, a microsurgical perspective here requires a big opening. It's a, a very long day. Uh, and this lady is not somebody that was very well equipped to undergo a big surgery. Um, and, and also from a technical perspective, reaching this spot low down on the basilar artery and having to work on top of this dome uh, on your way down, this is what you encounter first, is the most dangerous part of the aneurysm, is a challenge. There are there are certainly uh, people much more talented than myself who would uh, not think twice about doing that as necessary. But in my hands, uh, I tried to pick the right tool that I thought would give us a definitive answer. And we actually did a combination of coiling and flow diverting stent acutely. Again, that's not something we generally do uh, in the setting of a ruptured aneurysm. But in this case, we knew that we had uh, a ventricular drain in place that was in good position without any bleeding in the brain. Um, and she ultimately required a shunt. My practice is actually to use antibiotic impregnated EVD catheters so that in this situation where she required to be on two blood thinners acutely, I can just cut that catheter underneath the skin, hook it up to a shunt system, uh, and knock on wood, have not yet had a patient uh, with an infectious complication related to that. So our goal here was to densely coil that rupture site and then loosely coil back into this larger aneurysm because there's a very critical vessel here. This is actually an Ica Pica trunk. This is a, a much bigger vessel. You can see its mate over on the other side is a very small one. This goes to supply a critical portion of the brainstem, the hearing apparatus, as well as a large part of the hindbrain, the cerebellum. So preserving that is essential. Trying to coil this off entirely would require sacrificing the neck of that aneurysm. Um, and so in this situation, I loosely pack some coils here and then deposited a flow diverting scent that landed just below these vessels, the superior cerebellar arteries, and then landed just down here. And then this is kind of the sequence of events. This is what we saw immediately after surgery. The rupture site was protected. There was still some filling in the dome of the aneurysm, but that Ica Pica trunk wide open. Now I brought her back relatively early at three months to see how things looked. And she was still on, on dual antiplatelet therapy on aspirin and Plavix. And I was actually a little more concerned that we saw more of this lobule in place. Um, these runs don't really show it, but this, this contrast really lingered here, um, which is a sign that we know that it's likely to shut down. Uh, so I, I felt confident enough that we could, could wait it out. And with time, the flow remodeling effect becomes really apparent. Now we have a tiny amount of interstitial filling at, uh, at the core of this aneurysm, not in a site that we think is at all prone to rupture. That Ica Pica trunk is wide open. And in all honesty, I'm not sure that I can do a better job than that uh, clipping. And certainly um, in my hands, a much safer technique. But again, there are a lot of people who would say that that placing a flow diverter acutely um, in, in the setting of, 
of a ruptured aneurysm is something that that we shouldn't be doing unless we absolutely have to. There are a handful of, of aneurysm subtypes where we don't have great options otherwise, but um, having having enough fluency with this technique to know when you can reach for that tool in the right situation, I think is really critical. And these last two uh, cases really speak to uh, one of the true loves that I have, uh, which is cerebral bypass or revascularization. And this is a patient who had a subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, some 10 years prior related to this giant ICA terminus aneurysm. And he had undergone the, a coiling and stenting technique and, and as these aneurysms are wont to do, had multiple recurrences, added more coils, added more coils, and uh, the aneurysm continued to recur. Uh, and then eventually the decision was made to try and use a flow diverting stent. Uh, one of the interesting things I want to point out to you guys though is the mass of these coils here has actually altered the architecture of these blood vessels. Here you see the ICA terminus typ aneurysm typically projects up into the base of the brain. Over time, this aneurysm actually fell forward into a completely different trajectory as a, as a result of the weight of all this platinum in this patient's brain. Now, he ended up ended up undergoing a pipeline flow diverting stent from this MCA down into the ICA in the hope that the, the part of the aneurysm that was coming off of this, the anterior cerebral artery, would slowly shut down and, and would be supplied from the other side through the anterior communicating artery, and then would redirect flow past the aneurysm to the uh, MCA territory. It actually did the opposite. Unfortunately, the MCA shut down. It shut down slowly so the patient didn't have a catastrophic stroke, but the aneurysm continued to grow and that ACA stayed open. He returned to me with progressive enlargement of that aneurysm and began to have transient ischemic attacks, many strokes related to that, uh, that pipeline stent shutting down. So we took uh, a very aggressive course with him uh, because there's a way to deal with this aneurysm definitively. And so in that case, what we did was proximally occlude this aneurysm. So we put a clip on the carotid artery. This again is not a clippable aneurysm at this point. Um, taking coils out of an aneurysm is, is almost never a worthwhile idea. This actually is that choroidal artery we talked about before in the, the PCOM case. My preference would have been to clip just beyond that to allow the carotid to fill that um, in its natural fashion. Um, but the, the aneurysm had really blown out that segment of the artery so much that we couldn't do so safely. So these, this clip is placed, or these two clips are placed between the posterior communicating artery and the choroidal artery. Um, and then we plugged in two limbs of the scalp artery of the STA into the surface of the brain. So this is our ICG video angiography. This is the fluorescence technique. So sewn onto the, the vessels of the brain. So for those not familiar with the technique, we, um, we use suture uh, finer than a human hair. It's so small that uh, our techs hate to use it because we can barely see the needles in the suture uh, without the use of the microscope. But we directly attach that vessel that used to supply the scalp, and now it goes on to supply a big area of brain. So we see on the post-operative angiogram, the inflow into the aneurysm is completely shut down. Both limbs of the bypass are wide open and are supplying a huge area of the MCA territory and is yet to have another uh, transient ischemic attack. And we see that from the other side, the anterior cerebral artery is supplied by uh, the anterior communicating artery from the other side. And this is the recurrent artery of Huebner, another critical artery that we talk about. Um, and if you actually run these films out, there's a trickle of flow that gets down to supply that choroidal artery. Uh, but we don't see any opacification of, of the aneurysm. And this is an aneurysm that is otherwise untreatable, but I, that's why I, I take great pride in trying to have this, the, all of the options available so that when something like this comes along, we don't throw up our hands and say, well, we just have to hope that, that this doesn't get bad and doesn't rupture again. But this is a patient that's certainly at high risk for that, given the size the shape, the fact that he's had prior ruptures events before, it continues to grow. Um, so we're able to do the true definitive treatment for this. Um, and, and he's done very well. This is um, basically the worst type of brain aneurysm that you can encounter. This is a 58-year-old male, uh, uh, an entity that we call a dolichoectatic basilar aneurysm, which is for most people a death sentence. Okay, this is an aneurysm that blows out the entire wall of the carotid artery, or uh, excuse me, of the basilar artery. Um, and can kill people in any number of ways. They can bleed. Strokes can, uh, can happen because there's turbulent blood flow that slows down inside that artery. They can pick off tiny blood supply to the, to the brain stem or have more catastrophic strokes. Or like this patient did, slowly over time, he developed more and more progressive uh, pressure on his brain stem to the point where he's now struggling to walk. You can actually see that over time, he's developing swelling in, in the upper part of his brain stem. 
And as, as a result of the pressure on the drainage pathways of the spinal fluid, you can see he's slowly developed hydrocephalus or enlargement of those fluid spaces in the brain. So this is what his aneurysm looked like initially. This is deceptive. The aneurysm is actually much larger than this, but there's um, clot that's forming around it. And uh, this is the, the view from the, the injection through the left vertebral artery and then the right vertebral artery. And this is after a flow diverting stent treatment uh, that had been done that, that actually did the vast majority of, of taking care of this aneurysm. So from the right uh, vertebral artery all the way up to the basilar apex. And, and there was a, another flow diverting construct that really landed just shy of this inflow into the aneurysm, but it continued to grow. This patient continued to develop uh, difficulty walking. He was having multiple falls. And you can see this jet of blood that's still going up into the aneurysm and causing that clot to continue to grow, continue to press on the brainstem. Um, and so in this case, the patient was still ambulatory. He was still able to walk somewhat. We didn't feel that um, that it was necessary uh, to take on the morbidity that would be required to really take all of the clot out of that aneurysm. But we did want to try and arrest its growth and hopefully allow it uh, to shrink down over time, given that the flow diverting stent is, is doing the majority of the legwork here. Uh, that was a procedure that was done by my predecessor, Dr. Jenkowitz, who did beautiful work here. Uh, and so the plan was to make it feasible for us to shut down the inflow into this aneurysm with coils. But to do that, these two arteries, the pica and ica, the anterior and posterior inferior cerebellar arteries that in addition to supplying part of the hindbrain give off critical supply to the brainstem, uh, need to be supplied. They're actually being supplied from the end of this uh, left vertebral artery. So the plan was actually to bring these two pica arteries together, revascularize this pica, allow blood to flow to come back, and through these collateral channels, supply the ica as well. And then that would facilitate our ability to, to safely shut down this aneurysm. And that's exactly what we did. So we took them to the operating room for what we call a far lateral approach. Um, we can talk more if anybody has any questions about the details of how and why we chose a certain bypass uh, construct. But one of the things that I love about that set of techniques is it affords you a lot of creativity. Um, you, you know, when I talk to my residents, when we plan these procedures, uh, I like to go through our first, second, third tier options, understand you know, if something is, is a challenge, um, that uh, but that we can uh, revascularize uh, based on, on what the patient's anatomy gives us. And that's exactly what we did. So after uh, completing the bypass, you can see the anastomosis is here. Uh, you run it out further, you can actually see blood flow coming back into those more proximal segments and out into the ICA. And then the coil mass here that has shut down the flow into the aneurysm. And we have now cured this impossible to cure aneurysm. Uh, generally speaking, people die within a year, year and a half of being diagnosed with this problem. So my belief is that we should um, take a comprehensive approach. Uh, people in my shoes are often called hybrid neurosurgeons or dual trained neurosurgeons. I like the term comprehensive cerebrovascular surgery because my goal is to have all the right tools in my hand and then to be able to pick the right one. And certainly um, there is so much to be learned and so much to be gained. And I am very fortunate to have phenomenal mentors uh, on both sides of that spectrum. Uh, and in the philosophy where, where I trained in residency was that you know we were very much disease focused and wanted to have people that could offer all the right tools for the job. And that's something that, that I really took to heart. Um, and then I'm also blessed to have wonderful and creative partners here at UPMC um, that, that help me understand this disease process uh, in even better fashion and learn uh, tools and tips and techniques that uh, that I can use to to help my patients as well. So um, this, you know, when I'm not at home with with my lovely wife and two young kids who who I adore, this is what I do. Um, you know, my my fellowship director, Dr. Lawton, used to say that a day without an aneurysm is like a day without air, uh, and that's that's very much the case. This is um, a beautiful set of surgeries to do, and um, one way or the other, uh, we love doing them. Thank you, Dr. Lang. Uh, we had one question I'll have you answer and, and then we'll, uh, Dr. Lang, I had a very severe TBI when I was in my late 20s. They worried for years about an aneurysm. I have had TIA and, and in my mid 60s, what are the chances of one occurring right now in life? So uh, it would be unlikely at this point to develop a new aneurysm. Not impossible, but, but unlikely uh, this far along. There are, there are a subset of aneurysms that, that can develop, not what we call true aneurysms, but pseudoaneurysms, basically that result from a tear in the blood vessel as a result of trauma. 
but the aneurysms that we've largely talked about here are, are not the result of that. It's a relation, you know, relationship with the underlying stress, the way the blood vessels are put together when we're born, um, as well as the, um, you know, some, uh, some inherent genetic risk factors, as well as some of the choices that we make that can predispose people to forming them to begin with. Um, but at this point, I would say that it would be very unlikely. Sorry to Lang, are aneurysms inherited? Uh, do I need to be worried about my relatives? So that um, that is a, a point of contention. Uh, we we generally quote patients as as having an increased risk if there are two or more first degree family members. Uh, there's some evidence that that you can have up to a 10% risk of of a brain aneurysm, which above that two to three percent risk in the general population is significantly increased. Um, there, some of the best long-term and population-based uh, data that we have comes out of the group in, in Finland, uh, and that relationship may be a little less clear than we used to think. Um, but in general, it's still our practice. If you know, if there is a history of subarachnoid hemorrhage or, or multiple aneurysms in the family, uh, to at least consider offering um, uh, a screening tests to to family members. And the other part of it, and this is what I tell my patients all the time, is that um, the thing that we are worst at dealing with is understanding the psychological impact of this. Even just having an aneurysm that we follow, that we're observing for years, there are certain patients that are able to say, okay, I'll, I'll worry about it when we check in from year to year. Uh, and other patients that, that wake up in the morning thinking about it, going to bed at night thinking about it. And we know from, from studies on this topic that there's a true psychological impact that, that occurs from having that, um, that kind of event, uh, or that kind of diagnosis. Um, and so it's certainly the same is true amongst families. If, if you have a loved one who's had uh, kind of a catastrophic event from a ruptured aneurysm, um, knowing that, that you, know, you aren't necessarily at risk yourself can be a, a big weight off the mind, bad pun excluded. Um, how often uh, do patients with unruptured aneurysms experience warning signs before learning that they have an aneurysm? It's, it's still relatively uncommon. Again, it depends very much on uh, the nature of the aneurysm. Um, the, you know, the, the number of patients who have an aneurysm rupture in, in a population in a given year is about one in 10,000. And like we said, about one in 50 will harbor an aneurysm. So the, it's, it's relatively rare. The challenge that we face with brain aneurysms is that the, um, the classic presentation, that severe headache, that thunderclap headache, uh, you know, neck stiffness and pain uh, that, that we're taught in medical school to expect from subarachnoid hemorrhage isn't always the case. People can have uh, more vague symptoms and, and very often they can be misdiagnosed as something else. Headaches are very, very common. The list of things that cause them are about a million miles long. Um, occasionally there can be events that we call sentinel headaches that particularly for patients that don't have a history of chronic headaches that have a severe event, but it resolves relatively quickly and we don't see any evidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, it's, it's something that we consider as potentially a warning sign. And, and there certainly are cases of people who have those events and ignore them, but it's the, that's really the challenge is it's one of those things that we don't, it's, uh, it's uncommon enough that it's probably not worth screening everybody in the population. We don't recommend that everybody get an, an age 40 MRI scan to check for a brain aneurysm. Um, but there are a handful of symptoms that medical professionals really need to be aware of to, to be able to diagnose. Great. Dr. Lang, we appreciate your time so much. What a brilliant, brilliant presentation. Uh, again, we're so truly honored to have you with us at UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Freelander, would you like to wrap it up for with us uh, for the day? Sure. So uh, very uh, elegant uh, and comprehensive uh, uh, talk uh, today. Uh, very, very proud that uh, Dr. Lang is part of our uh, team. We have a phenomenal uh, team here uh, taking care of uh, uh, cerebrovascular uh, disease. So again, it's a, it's a great team effort and what we always want to make sure is that we have the patient uh, undergo what we believe would be the best possible treatment. Uh, uh, we're all true partners, so we, we share, we, we discuss the cases and, and try to come up uh, with the answers for these, uh, for these very, very complex uh, problems. So again, um, uh, uh, very proud of him, and uh, um, I look forward to seeing you all at, uh, at, at our next uh, session. Uh, have a safe and a wonderful weekend and week, and we'll see you soon. Take care.